to extrapolate on the past or if he's going to ask me about SWOT analysis, right, which we are going to use, but we're going to use it from the point of view of 2030. We're not going to use it from the point of view of 2021. Uh, we are going to do SWOT analysis. Uh, but if he starts using SWOT analysis in an extrapolative, like he's extrapolating on what we've done in the past. Okay, uh, again, hello everyone. Welcome to the Actionable ESG Talk Series brought to you by Actionable Knowledge Foundational Institute, a KFI, the world's first nonprofit industry consortium committed to bridging the gap between ESG, sustainability, and digital transformation. My name is Isabella, the co-host of this talk series, here with Manuel, another co-host, and our special guest today, Bill. Hi, Bill. Good to see you again. Love to have you. Good morning, Isabella. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. And uh, for those who didn't get to join us last time, a little bit more about Bill. Um, Bill is a futurist <coughs> and he helps CEOs and boards of directors to envision their future. Um, he's also an author, a writer, a non-traditional strategic planning businessman. Bill has a book came out called The Strategic Planning in This Age of Disruption and the other one called The Four Horsemen Envisioning 2030, which is the number one um, best-selling on Amazon in the business planning uh, genre. So very happy to have you here today, Bill, and look forward to further exploring our conversation. All right, so um, to start a talk, last time we spoke about skepticals, uh, the, uh, all the skeptics questioning the ability to envision the future. And as a follow up, could you give us a couple of cases when you were able to uh, moderate or even change the mindset of executives? And what's your secret sauce? Uh, a very good question, and, and uh, un unfortunately, it's not a black and white answer. Uh, we all do it. I think it's human nature. We, we like to be in our comfort zone. Uh, when we work with a company, uh, we tend to build silos uh, for protection, for comfort. So I think uh, silo is just another name for a comfort zone. And I, I, I remember when you, when you asked that question, I, I, I remember often I will be uh, with a CEO or president of a company as, uh, as they give me a tour through the plant so I will understand better uh, what, is, uh, what, is, uh, they are, what they are doing. And, and you probably know if you, you've been in business enough, long enough, especially I've been in manufacturing my whole career. So as I walk through the shop floor, I have a sixth sense. I don't know how to describe it, but just how people walk, how people talk to each other. You can almost smell it in the air, but you get, a, you get a, uh, an understanding of the company just with the tour. But in that tour, invariably, every time I've ever been on a tour with a CEO, we will meet up with somebody and the CEO will say, uh, Bill, I would like you to meet Joe or Sam or Mary or whatever. Joe has been with us for 35 years and my brain does a little whiplash thing um because i don't know i know what i'm supposed to do i'm supposed to say joe 35 years wonderful congratulations right but the truthful side of me wants to say joe i am so sorry to hear that because you've been coming to the same place every day for 35 years there's a big world outside <laughs> things are happening outside do you know what they do you know what's happening uh and and further how how can you be at your highest level of productivity 
benefiting your company when you've been one place for 35 years. And that's so that's what I want to say. Uh, but I don't ever say that. I don't ever say that. Sometimes back in the CEO's office, I will say that to the CEO. Because the very first thing that we need to do uh, in order to envision the future, we put together a planning team from among the employees of the company. And there's all sorts of rules that we try to follow to get the best team. Um, but the very first thing that we need to do is an exercise we call wake up. Uh, and that is to try to shake people out of their their roles that they have been playing uh, for as long as they've been there. And so on the planning team, we always insist that there be a couple of people who have are newly joined with the company, been there less than a year because they have the freshest eyes. Uh, so when you ask about what are the what happens when we we have skeptics everybody starts out being a skeptic because this is not a generally well understood approach to planning the well understood approach is to do a little bit more of what you've been doing but do it a little bit better that's the that's what people are used to doing uh, and and what we try to do is try to envision the future uh, in such a way that we can we we are familiar with the future um and then we try to plan backwards and that planning backwards becomes the strategic plan so uh i see i told you it was not a black or white answer so mm -hmm. people as as we're working with the planning team and the ceo is a part of the planning team but he's not allowed to talk he or she has to shut up because everybody else the other nine members of the team are watching the ceo and half of them are going to whichever if the ceo says something an opinion or this is what is important to us half of the planning team is going to parrot what he said and 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 brown knows that's because that's what they do that's what people in an organization do and so that's not honest that's not where we want to go and the other half of the people will shut up and not say anything so so the CEO is going to be there so so he or she can hear, but they're not allowed to talk. So uh, except at the very beginning where they where they're supposed to, they have to say for 60 seconds, they have to say uh, support for this project. So this is the most important thing that this company is doing in 2022 and say that uh, and then go to the back of the room and be quiet, please. Um, and so the CEO and I will have a conversation about what his or her role in this is um and 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 the first day that we have that planning team together i look around the room and people are looking like okay prove it to me okay i don't believe it okay you know i get this this challenging stare uh, mm -hmm. not mean not a bad you know no no ill will intended but they don't believe it so it's something that we have to show them that it works and that's usually fairly easy to say uh, to show them um, because these people have been at the same company doing the same thing with the same co-workers for you know one year five years ten years the longer it goes on um, the, the more uh, disruptive our program is going to be to them um, so so it's not uh it's not black and white i don't convince them and they stay convinced no unfortunately we keep uh, backsliding it's very easy to backslide um and so what i ask everybody on the planning team to do is when you're having conversations with the other people on the team either in this session or uh, between sessions then be on the lookout you're the sheriff when you see somebody being held back by the old beliefs or by what we've always been good at or by that's not the way we do things here they're being held back with very strong chains held back from envisioning the future uh, and you need to be the sheriff and you need to say hey joe <laughs> i think you just were looking in the rearview mirror and you can make a joke out of it but we don't realize that we're doing that so the hardest thing to do is to keep people envisioning the future looking at that future that took us 
you know, three or four or five months to to get a feel for that and to and to look at it from lots of different angles and so on. Uh, and it's so easy to say or to say something that means I'm nervous about the future. I mm -hmm. don't understand it well enough, and I don't want to go there, right? Because that's that's what our, our human psyche makes us do. And so we have to help each other. The three of us have to help each other. And when you see, if I see Manuel starting to uh, to extrapolate on the past, or if he's going to ask me about SWOT analysis, right, which we are going to use, but we're going to use it from the point of view of 2030. We're not going to use it from the point of view of 2021. Uh, we are going to do SWOT analysis. Uh, but if he starts using SWOT analysis in an extrapolative, like he's extrapolating on what we've done in the past, then we're going to stop the conversation for just a minute. I'm going to ask him, think about what you just said. Did you mean to say that? Maybe I'm misinterpreted. So I, you know, I, I give him the chance of explaining. <laughs> so, um, so yes, we're faced in, repeatedly with uh, skeptics. And so, uh, sometimes I get to be a skeptic myself, but we can't get uh, through it. You said a number of important points, but one which um, I got one time from a, a partner in business, uh, and he's an expert in cultural change. And mm -hmm. I asked him, define me culture, and he said there are hundred definitions of culture. But he said, if you want culture definition for a culture of a company, it's what exactly you said. It's how we do things around here. And you also show that you are a keen observer of people in the room. You you explain it very clearly. And have you noticed what we call it the aha moment, the Tiffany, you know, the business business books come up with different names for that, but the moment that people realize that they have to let the new come and work with the world. And, you know, have you, you know, maybe you, men you mentioned CEO sitting in the room. Have you seen them going through an aha moment? And you see it on their face. It's like, oh, oh, this, this is, that's the that's the beauty of it, man. To me, to me, that's the beauty of it. Um, and and oftentimes, these nine or ten or eleven people will be in the room. We'll be talking about some sort of subject. And one of the things we get them to do at the very beginning is you have to subscribe to one of these uh, or two or three of these uh, futurist uh, newsletters or blogs or something. Have to start getting new inputs, and so as they're talking around the room and one person will say, well, I read a really interesting thing this week. It's all about the blah, blah, blah. And one else and somebody else will say, oh, and I was looking at the uh, from a different point of view. And they said that the, when that happens, then it could mean this or this is going to happen. And then somebody else. And so we call that a popcorn conversation because it's just popping, popping on this side of the room, that side of the room. And what they're doing is they're waking up and they're and it's it's a aha moment. It's it's a and it's really great to see people being joyful about what's coming and understanding a little piece about what's coming. And you put enough of those little pieces together, and people will say, "This has been a very interesting discussion. I can't wait until next week." Excellent. Well. Uh... <laughs> I'm tempted. I'm tempted to continue with uh, questions on this line, but in the previous uh, talk, we also talked about purpose, and we talked about education and education with purpose. And I think we started the thread, and we still, if, mm -hmm. if we can continue, what what your views are? How do we do that? And uh, here, here I wanted to mention that in, in a sort of a different space in the future. Uh, Isabella's book, as I mentioned in the previous talk, is really looking at questions. It's questioning the uh, uh, generations, the present, the Gen Zers, the, the future generations. How are we going to factor in technology? How are we factor in, you know, a new purpose, a new meaning for our lives? So purpose and education is sort of the 
the the thread I wanted to continue to work on with you. If that's uh, okay. Uh, uh, again, Manuel. Um, gosh, I wish that there were two or three sentences that I could say. Okay, this is the definition of purpose. Um, here's how you find your purpose. Here's what you do with it. Um, uh, but there's uh, it's many many layers to to this concept. Starting with purpose is not the word that everybody uses. Lots of people say meaningfulness or mindfulness or you know and there the, or the, the truths. What is what is the truth? We had that conversation um, and and. And, and it seems like everybody wants to claim their own brand, so they so they hang a new word on it. Uh, so if we can just look past that, and 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 and, and you'll forgive me if I use the word purpose. Um, mm -hmm. My purpose in in my life has changed dramatically over the years, and and I think I think I'm I'm not unique in that. I think most everybody goes through evolution of purpose. Uh, I, I mentioned before, uh, for for many years, uh, my purpose was to put uh, bread on the table and shoes on the kids' feet, and that's and that's an all-consuming purpose, and it keeps me kept me for a long time from thinking more general thoughts uh, or more world-like thoughts. My world was like this big. I had to do this. I had to be there at this time. I had schedules down to the minute. And, and and that was my purpose. Today, um, I am not constrained by those things, and my purpose is uh, focused um, a, a, a great deal on 2030. And the reason it's focused on 2030, and I think I showed you this before, that's my purpose. His name is Noah. His, he's, he's 18 months there. And and last night we uh, we had a birthday celebration for his baby sister who uh, was just one year old this weekend. Um, so my purpose has expanded a little bit, but still it's to help mommy and daddy to teach them because they're learning very differently from the way that mommy and daddy learned about a whole range of things like. Uh, what is money? What is work? What is um, just a whole range? What is religion? What is mobility? What are my neighbors? What is love? There's all these things they need to learn um, to become second nature. And they're learning them very differently than the way that mommy and daddy learned them. And mommy and daddy in the 90s learned them very differently than the way I learned them in the 60s. Uh, so how will people learn that in 2030 each of these different questions so my purpose today is to help mommy and daddy teach those things to these three beautiful little kids um and at the same time i'm just one person out of eight billion is the number now right um, how much can i change the world or this community that I live in, I live in Milford, Connecticut, and so do they. How, how much can I change Milford, Connecticut uh, to make it more uh, accommodating for these three kids? So I need to change, I need to help change them to teach them. I need to help teach the community. And that's my purpose at this point. I will give you a, a case and I have two futurists here. I have Isabella, you know, and you, and it's 2030, and Noah is in grade one or two, right? Eight years, seven, eight years. What, how would you organize a class for a kid in 2030? And I know there is no perfect answer. <laughs> we talked about the fact that predicting the future is uh, dangerous, and, and uh, you know, many times you have resistance, but... <clears throat> Looking at the future, you know, we are we are only eight years, seven, eight years away. These kids will grow. They need an education. We have technologies. We have uh, new rules. We have a society in change. So, Bill, maybe a little That's bit a of good, insight. 
It's another it's another good question, Manuel. You 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 know how to ask good questions. Um, so uh, that's many different levels. So one of the most important to me, the one of the most important things that we need to teach them uh, is we need to teach them respect. We need to teach them love. We need to teach them the joy of creating. There's many different things that we need to teach them. Uh, so we we want them to conform, but we don't want them to conform too much. So we need to teach them boundaries on conforming. How do we teach that? Not out of a book, but by getting down on the floor and playing with them and making sure that they always say please and thank you. It's just the simple stuff like that, I think. It's laughing with them, showing them that they can do something that we can laugh at. And they will do that again. Uh, my one-year-old granddaughter loves to engage with her eyes. And she even has learned to be coy. Um, and so she will look out of the corner of her eyes at you, or she'll turn her head the other way and look at you out of the corner of her eyes, and, which I find fascinating. Who taught her that? How did she learn that? I don't know, um, but uh, she's beginning to talk. And so when if she and I are having this face-to-face, -face, if she goes da-da, I go da-da back at her. And if when I respond to her like that, then she says ma-ma-ma, ba-ba-ba, and whatever she says, I say. And uh, and and we have a conversation. And, and so too many children, I think, are caught in not um, in, in having to play their role, be quiet, shut up, don't touch, uh, mommy and daddy are busy, and so on. Um, and I can really relate to that, but I think that that's the best thing we can do as a teacher. And then they're going to be learning. We, we are teaching the six-year-old now, Noah, how to code. He's got games that he learns how to code. He will be using... Uh, his school is using the, the seventh and eighth graders are using virtual reality headsets. Um, so he, the one year old knows how to swipe my cell phone, right? You swipe to another screen, she can do that. So the technology is, uh, they're, they're way ahead of us. And so we need to guide them. My opinion, we need to guide them what's good, what's bad. My kids are, my grandkids are not allowed to watch play shooting games of any sort right when i was a kid we played war all the time we had guns we learned how to die real good right so, uh, so bill when we look at um, this and of course bringing into into the picture sustainability esg uh, and and technology and actually i'll i'll uh, ask uh, maybe isabella to to uh, also talk a little bit because she looked a, uh, deeper into the technology and the uh, benefit and the threats. And again, we are in the class of 2030. Your one-year-old is now eight or nine. <laughs> so we, uh, um, we have different tools. We have a different environment. Uh, you know, ESG, uh, despite of all these questions we raise and all these uh, <clears throat> Uh, greenwashing and so on going, going on, in 2030, things will have to settle. And how is this classroom? Isabella, maybe I'll let you take it from here. When, when I was listening to this future generation topic, yeah, I have a lot of personal feelings as a relatively younger generation and also uh, my own understanding, um, especially as I came across more new terms to me, things like co-creation, things like how to empower younger generation into the process of building the future. And I, I, I don't remember when I actually stopped thinking. I actually being con subconsciously doing that. It's I stopped thinking about, you know, the, the, the behavior 
meaning to teach the younger generation. When I I love kids, and、um, people around me know that a lot. Like in their, especially younger, like. Under six,、uh, because as they grow older, you know you can see how they've been shaped in a certain way. They're not being themselves. And then I recently realized the reason I love to interact with them, it's it's they are my teacher in a lot of sense. Like.、Mm, When we're interacting them, I notice other adults or the system will often correcting them.、Uh, oh, wait a minute, do it this way. And when they're doing craft, I I volunteer in church,、uh, serving kids sometimes, and there's always a set of rule there. And when the kids trying to do something different, the the first reaction is, oh wait, don't do that. This is supposed to be where you do it, and it it didn't mean they're doing wrong. They were just going with their you know inner. Inner feeling, and、um, maybe because my experience encouraged me to appreciate, you know, to to following your own feeling more so. So I'm always encourage them to do what they want to do, even if it's a mess on the craft, even you know the ice is on the wrong place.、Um, because from my own experience, the Isabella now happened or became not because. Because there's the old version Isabella. Before I went to college, I I study abroad. That was the the one that was shaped by the heavy education systems in China, and I was relatively a different person, same nature, but I, I was different, and it all changed. I wrote this in the in my book, very early chapter, because、uh, I'm passionate about sharing my transformation. All changed when there were a breakdown in my health situation, and then my parents probably had that kind of realization ever before. And ever since then,、uh, they let me go on my own, meaning to fully support what I want to be. You can be on the street, homeless, or just whatever you feel like, Isabella. Go for it. And that's when the new Isabella was born. I came to this point. So that wouldn't happening if I didn't. Follow what I want to do. Get encouragement. So I think that's what the younger generations needs to be supported more than ever because they're more conscious than ever. They know things more than we thought they knew because of the the things that they get access to because of the technologies. So maybe that's a big process. We need to keep talking, encourage this process, and let them be who they are. As Bill was mentioning, how did she know to do that? Because they were born smart. They were born knowing things that we as adults has been probably forget about it. So that's what I wanted to share about the generation. And in terms of the future sustainability, the classroom, I think it's also again it follow a lot on the younger generation's perspective because we think a lot. In the perspective that we've been shaped, and I see a lot of hopes from the younger generations, the grandchildrens,、yeah. and they have a, a bright future ahead of them in building this green, sustainable world society. You you also reminded me about、uh, professors、uh, Laura and Derek Cabrera when they talked about how you teach kids. How you teach kids in the classroom? It is in one of uh, our previous uh, actionable ESG, and uh, uh, it, uh, as Isabella and you, Bill said, it's give give kids freedom early. Let them play. Let them experiment. And、uh, actually, we probably have less answers about the sustainable future that we don't have twenty years ago because it was. As you described in your books, was a linear prediction. Okay, more energy, more of this, more computing power, more of that, more cars, more roads, more you know, more fuel, more dependence on on、uh, oil and gas, and、uh, and then we are at the point of discontinuity, and this is the reason I ask you, Bill, about the 2013 Isabella. Actually,、uh, I feel like I'm interviewing you both now instead of. <laughs> <laughs> Co-hosting bill, but we are at this point where sustainability hangs on, and the ESG, you know, in terms of finance, hangs on、uh, together with technology, 
above the head of my generation. Yeah. May I say beyond our generation. The, yeah, I, you, you put that very well, Isabella. Um, and and the and I, I just a little side note. I love uh, the ESG in in your your organization's name, especially I like the G, and that's an area that we don't talk about enough. And maybe in the future we can talk about uh, ethics and governance, uh, because so much of what they're going to be experiencing in twenty thirty or twenty forty is how we as the older generations not putting, I'm putting you in a separate generation uh, so so much of what we do uh is is uh, is the, the the technologies and the changes and yet we don't talk enough about what we should be doing and how should this look um and 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 should everybody have access to education everybody in the world not just in this country should everyone have and 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 the shoulds and i always hesitate to use the word should because it, it, it's some mm. sort of judgment right mm. um but ethics and and governance are about the shoulds and so I really feel that we need to, and and they're the they're the boundaries, right? You you can be free and you can do whatever you want, um, but there are some boundaries, right? My daddy used to say, "You are free to swing your arms wherever you want. Your freedom to do that stops at my nose, right?" I can remember him saying that. Mm -hmm. So there are no absolute freedoms about anything, and so we need to teach the children teach ourselves, remind ourselves uh, what these boundaries are, and that's in the form of ethics and governance issues. So I'm just glad to see the G in your ESG, actually, ESG. Thank you very much, Bill. And, you know, we <laughs> I, I would wish we have an extra hour together, uh, but I will uh, go to sort of a summary question. And in, in, and you, you are so generous with your time and, and uh, you know, sharing your insights and sharing your books and sharing your knowledge and the experiences. Um, so, and, and whenever I ask a question to sort of pin it down to short recommendations, I'm sort of concerned that I ask again the wrong question. <laughs> but mm -hmm. let me go for it. I'm actually trying to figure out from our conversations um, can you make three four five recommendations on of advice right the, the should part that you just mentioned um, to, to approach the study of the future so your experience what what would you say you know how should they approach the study of the future how should they approach uh, our uh, perspective of the future. So the first thing that was helpful for me was in having discussions like we're having right now. Um, mm -hmm. th they say that the future uh, w is arriving um, uh, on the back of language. So language is the transport mode. Uh, we think in a language. Um, and the more we talk about the language, using language, and we talk about the future, uh, in fact, we are helping to create the future right now. In this conversation, we are creating the future because it becomes a little bit more understandable in each of our minds. Um, and, and probably we turn around and we have uh, parts of conversations with other people, maybe our spouse or maybe our whatever, after we leave this one, right? And um there are many groups like this uh this year i probably had uh, this sort of group conversation 20 or 25 times because there are a lot of people who are interested in what 2030 will look like or 2040 or and and would love to develop 
the possibilities. And so, number one, talk. You can't think it. No one person is smart enough to sit down and connect all the dots and rationalize uh, the future. Can only be done together through using language. So that would be number one. And number two, don't fear change. We have always been changing. It it's different now than it was in you know in 1960. It's different now than it was in 1940. It's changing. It's changing a little bit faster, but change by itself. What would you know, the the first, um, uh, Amazon shipped the first book in 1995. That's not only well within my lifetime. I'm not sure if you remember 1995, but, um, and, and the first iPhone was shipped in 2007. And what changes these two things brought? Airbnb, you know, come on. So many changes we've seen and adopted. And... Our life is a little bit more, it, it's better in a lot of ways. It's not so good in some ways, but because there's always pros and cons, but we've adopted these changes and tried to find good things, reasons for them. So, so don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid of change. Um, lots of, lots of little other side issues, but Isabel, what do you see um, uh, as, as, little tidbits that might help people to prepare for 2030. Thank you, Bill, for including me in this wrap up conversation um, to acknowledge my futurist, you know, potential. Uh, I really appreciate the, the change part. Uh, that's actually one of the main themes in my book is to just accept it as a norm, as a dynamic process, because there's no stat like stay still i i specifically mentioned so i want to add in your second point there's no stay still you're either forward you're backward and anything that says we're stable we're going to stand still here that's not true so it's our decision to pick either it's forward or you're going to go backwards so it's our decision to choose the bright side to find the opportunity so change means opportunity change is a hopeful term we want that we don't want to wake up feeling like we don't have anything to look forward to so i think that's the mindset we all need to think when it comes to facing the uncertainty the change today is to embrace the bright side because we automatically even me uh, very often we attach it to the downside of it meaning we're gonna break our balance we're gonna lose money we're gonna uh we're not gonna know what's gonna what's gonna happen but it's actually it's the equal position like 50 50 on the other side so we just need to force ourselves to always on the other side and to think as a good thing and this will happen to the executives that when the corporate is changing i think a lot of time the difference between entrepreneurs and executives is they're seeing a different side of the risk approach or or when a new initiative comes up they're seeing a different side of it so one is more embra embrace the other so that's what i want to add into bill your second point of embracing change and that's critical yeah. critical critical in building the future and I I one on, more? i'm sorry go ahead yeah. i'm sorry i didn't mean to no no no. <laughs> i was going to say for the record this is the third point it's not it's not that's two, a, two a <laughs> That's the third point. And, and the fourth point is, as we can see around us, uh, all the polarization and all the people in trouble, either in their own minds or uh, trying to leave their uh, home country or whatever. Uh, but as we look around us, the world needs more acceptance, love, compassion, uh, understanding. And so if everybody in the world would pick up that number four item and just show a little compassion and you know thank so that that's what that will help us get to the future as well thank you very much thank you both as i said i feel like i run an interview on both 
today. <laughs> and I, I want to add something to what Isabella said. So if with our conversations, we tip the balance a little bit to a better future to, you know, 51% versus 49%, I want to congratulate you both because that's very important. And, you know, you think a little step, 1% is not much, but it's much. It's going to change. Isabella, I'm back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And I can see, Bill, we're going to have a continuous discussion, even it's not on here, but uh, we're going to continue this future building process, as you mentioned, by talking it, even by more, you know, work on it to, to actually building the future. We're not just, you know, forecasting or predicting the future. And I love that perspective of yours. Right. Thank you. And thank you for, again, taking the time, Bill, and to our, our audience. Uh, if you didn't catch up the last episode of Bill's conversation, make sure you can check on our YouTube channel. It's, it's live there. Uh, and make sure you're tuning in every week for a new episode of AKFI's Actionable ESG Talk series, where you will gain new perspectives on how to mitigate risks and create value by integrating ESG and digital transformation. Thank you all so much. Until the next week. Goodbye for now. Bye, Manuel. Bye, Bill. Goodbye. Goodbye, Bill. Bye. Bye, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Bye, Thank Isabella. You, Isabella. Thank you.